Thanks you can to go ahead, Nikki. Okay. Um, hi, thanks to everyone for joining us, both um, in the Zoom and on the live stream. If you want to introduce yourself in the chat, um, that would be great. Um, you can just say what, what your name is or wh where you're, you know, calling in from, or not calling in, zooming from. Um, and also, we'll be doing Q and A after each talk, so you can. I think you can even unmute yourself and ask a question, but you can also just put it in the chat and I'll ask the artists after the talk. Um, so my name is Nikki Selkin and I am the creative development director at Gray Area, which is sort of like, um, like a cross between a education director and a curator. I don't know, <laughs> it's a funny, a funny role. Basically I run all the education programs and also the um, artist incubator programs and other sort of research labs and things that we do working, basically working with the artists that come through. Um, this salon has been going on for a number of years now. We normally do it twice a year in the middle of our incubator program that runs for six months. And in case you don't know a lot about Gray Area, I'll just do a quick blurb about us. We are a nonprofit that um, with a mission to apply art and technology to create civic and social impact through education incubation and public events. And one of the things that I'm, I've like pushed and I'm really proud of that we do is um, developing an engagement model for creating a sort of a positive feedback loop um, from audience inspiration uh, all the way to community leadership. And our public events programs draw audiences in with, you know, live performances, educational offerings, and um, incubator programs like this one where you can, you know, scale and refine the projects you're working on. And after completing, you know, our creative code immersive program or the incubator program, often artists come through and will teach classes with us or perform with us, or, you know, just keep working with us in many different ways as they sort of move through the trajectory of their careers. And I think that, for example, there are folks in this um, salon who were originally students in our creative code immersive that I invited to join the incubator and who have since gone on to then become teachers and um, do, you know, research labs and other things that we have offering here. So, and then also, you know, other crazy cool exhibition opportunities elsewhere. And I think um, that's something I'm just, I feel like we do really well and it's kind of unique within the arts, particularly arts and technology community, but even within the arts community. And a lot of the courses we give are some of the only classes you'll find outside of a university in those topics. Like we just did an NFT and blockchain workshop with Sarah Friend. We just did a six week UX um, tech and ethics workshop with um, Caroline Cinders. And these are, you know, experts in their field that are kind of folks that you really, it's, you know, it's hard to pin down to teach these, these classes. And um, that's something we really strive to do is create like post, I guess you'd say postgraduate, you know, education opportunities for people. Um, anyway, that's enough bragging about gray area, but today we have, um, I think it's only, if we originally gonna have six, we actually have only five artists talking, but that's okay. Cause what they're saying is pretty awesome. And there's some of the talks are a little longer. Um, so I think it'll all we'll even out in the wash. Um, the artists we have today are Stephen Pai Seki, uh, I say Demir, Stephanie Andrews, Suyach Joshi and Tywin Kelly. And Tywin's actually been our intern and working with us for since last year for quite a while. You've probably seen a lot of his writing um, on our medium and things like that. So and a lot of his graphic design work. So um, I was just really excited about the work he's been doing and invited him to speak at this uh, salon. We often have folks that are visiting or in other ways, not necessarily in our incubator joining. So that's, this is our Tywin um, debut. Um, yeah, so without further ado, I would like to um, give Stephen, Steve Pye the floor, that's his nomer, um, and just so you guys know, once again, there'll be a talk that's maybe 10 minutes, maybe a little bit more, and then we'll at, do a Q&A session, and then we'll go to the next talk. So yeah, I, I guess, Matt, you're going to control the pinning the speaker and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, Steve. Well, take it away. I won't introduce you because you're going to introduce yourself. 
<laughs> okay. But I'm very excited about this talk. Very excited. Okay. Thank you, Nikki. Let's see. And I'm just going to go ahead and click the share. And hopefully everybody can see that well. Yes, I can see it. Okay. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for coming to our artist salon. I'm Steve Pai or Steve Piasecki. And I am here to talk about NFTs. So first, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit. I'm an artist and I do photography, video and installation work. I did my undergrad at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And shortly after finishing my degree in 1992, I moved here to San Francisco. I started out in an era when the digital transformation of photography was beginning. And most of my work in school was done with film and wet chemistry. Shown here is a piece that I did in 1990. I recently found it in one of my portfolios while I was doing some COVID pandemic inspired cleaning of my closets. This is the L track of the O'Hare Blue Line as it runs through Wicker Park in Chicago. I shot this on a four by five view camera with film and then printed it in a darkroom. To achieve the visual effect you see, I flipped the negative over to make a mirror image and then mounted the two prints together. This piece is about the energy of the city and its trains and how they move through a landscape and how our perception of that landscape can be affected by the things that humans do. So what was interesting for me though, is when I found this piece and I saw an echo of my most recent work here at Gray Area. So during the pandemic, I did a lot of walking and biking around San Francisco and captured a lot of the landscape. But so much of it was surreal because it was either empty or just plain out of context. So I started manipulating the images into mandalas, um, which is a theme that I address a lot in my work, as you can see from, from the previous uh, slide. So here we have a house in Hayes Valley. And on the other image, we have the Mira uh, condo building, which is over by Rincon Hill. In this next slide, um, see that there's a number of these that I created, and this is just a small sample of the pieces. So this is a, an empty street in Hayes Valley. And the other image is the front of the NEMA apartment complex on Market Street. Eventually with all these, I created a video of them that was shown in our last showcase here uh, at Gray Area in our virtual showcase that happened in New Art City. So having been living here for a while, and you know, trying to work as an artist the, and, and being an artist and declaring yourself as an artist, a question that you get a lot is how do you make a living as an artist? So prior to the web, reaching large audiences was pretty difficult. You can work in commercial art and do what other people want, or you can try to make your own work and survive on that. But how do you get noticed? So in the, in the 1980s and early 1990s, easy and expensive copying techniques made zine and mail art very accessible to everyone. And networks of artists were sharing work with one another in that fashion could be found in a lot of places. Sometimes you could just respond to ads or just submit work to various zine publishers and get yourself known that way. I had been doing a mail art for a little while as a way to reach other artists in other places. One of my favorite pieces I did involved San Francisco after I first moved here it was I made several pieces that got mailed to different places and that had instructions for them to contact the other people and get together. One had a set of photos of various places around San Francisco, one had a map of the city with markings where the photos had been taken, and one had various things that I picked up in the city. The idea was for people to experience the city in the same way I had, and for me to share what I was finding in the city with them. It was a way to communicate and get people to respond to my work. But it was the early 90s and along came the web and then everything started to change. And the promise of the web was that we were going to be able to tear down the barriers that prevented people from communicating with one another. Technology was now cheap enough and ubiquitous enough to allow a many-to-many -many publishing model. And many times that could be happening right from the comfort of your home or your studio. We believed it would be impervious to censorship, and we believed that it also would be democratizing for the entire world. And it was a way to have your portfolio out there and get your work out there for other people to see. And sometimes that's success, successful, but other times it's not, because what happens is that the way that artists really get known is through their social connections. So the rise of the web was important for artists because it became very easy and relatively inexpensive way to promote yourself and show your work and then meet a network with other artists. 
but it still means that the artist has to hustle and network. In 2012, curators at the Museum of Modern Art in New York did a study of artists who were working in the earliest, early 20th century and found that the artists with the largest social contacts or networks became the most famous. An article published on artsy.com in 2019 about this research stated that artists with large and diverse network of contacts are most likely to be famous regardless of how creative their art was. Specifically, the greatest predicator of fame for an artist was having a network of contacts in various countries. So for artists, the greatest asset is the network that they cultivate. So I put together a few examples of other artists to show uh, or, or to talk about how some of them have done this. So here we have artists who hustle. Artists make a living by selling their work. And here's an example of an artist named Jim Wright, AKA Stone Kettle, who's a photographer in Florida. He sells photography and handcrafted wood items to his followers on his Etsy store. But what he is really known for is his writing on politics and science fiction. And he has a very entertaining Twitter presence. And he uses that presence to encourage buyers of his work with limited edition sales that he does from time to time on his Etsy store. Another artist we have is a um, Northern California artist by the name of Jeremy Novi. He's a street artist who specializes in stencil designs. His work is in several cities around the world. He's most known for his koi goldfish and these can be found in many places around San Francisco, typically on the sidewalk um, in front of a doorway. Uh, in front of places where people are going. So as you're walking through a doorway, you're going to see his work. And he also has done some mural pieces as well. Next, we have another artist um, who's working here in San Francisco, and this is Finch. He works predominantly uh, in San Francisco, like I said, and he's gotten to be very popular and controversial during the pandemic because of his Honey Bear series. It has become ubiquitous in the city, but he did this through gamification. People who purchased his work were encouraged to post their pieces in their windows and then go around the city and see the other honey bears that were posted in other windows and then mark those all on a map, of course, in a web browser on your smartphone. So these are just some examples of the ways that artists can get themselves noticed. But of course, because we're in Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley always has a different solution to this problem. And this is the non-fungible token. It has become quite well known recently as a way for artists to make money by selling their work. At a basic level, an NFT is an entry in a blockchain network that confers ownership of a particular digital file. Because it is part of a blockchain, it's considered to be immutable. It can also include a smart contract as part of that, uh, part of that blockchain, which can be executed in the future given certain conditions. So to understand this a little bit more deeply, what an NFT is, we should have an understanding of what the blockchain is. So something that's important to remember when talking about NFTs is understanding what they are. They're entries on a shared decentralized ledger known as the blockchain. A blockchain is essentially a database that is distributed across a network with each entry or block in, in the database being added sequentially one after another in the, as known as the chain. Each entry is tied to the entry that came before it using a cryptological function to encode the data. Thus, it can be played backwards or forwards, and you can see what the different transactions were in the past. Bitcoin was the first implementation of blockchain technology. So it can be described as either a currency, as some of its uh, proponents say, or as a store of value where people are just investing money and leaving it there, such as, 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 it, as it were with gold. So anything can be in a block. And in the case of an NFT, it's just a certificate essentially of, of ownership. So with this, I decided to go ahead and try my hand at creating an NFT. So what I did is I took one of my animations from the Urban uh, Mandala series and I used OpenSea. Now the process is rather straightforward. You need to have a cryptocurrency wallet and you need to sign up with a site that allows you to do minting into a network. And there are several different networks. Um, Ethereum is just, being the, the, is just known as the largest and biggest. Um, but there are plenty others and they're not all using the Ethereum network as well. 
But I found the experience behind this really isn't any different than opening an Etsy store or trying to sell work at a street fair as I've done in the past. You still have to attract your customer and you still have to get them to buy. So in terms of the selling process or, or, or getting my work out there, it doesn't seem to be all that much different. But one thing that is different about NFTs is that it gives the idea of the authentic work and the ownership of the work. And one thing that's very important to art collectors, which is the audience I'm selling to, is the concept of provenance. This word comes from the French verb provenir. That means to either come from or to arise from. Provenance is the story of the history of a piece of art from when it was created and what has happened to it since it was created. As an artist, you can create a catalog of your work and your sales, but many artists just don't do that, at least until later in their careers and they've already achieved some success. So without a record of, you, of what you've made, it can be very easy for someone to fake one of your pieces. For example, in the movie uh, Made You Look, which is a documentary about fake art, um, we see how the, um, the forgers were able to create not just realistic replicas of say Rothko's and, and other uh, abstract expressionist art, art pieces, but they're also able to um, fake the provenance for those pieces as well, either by creating the actual certificates or by convincing the curators uh, and the, the, the people who hold the, the estates for those artists that these pieces were real. So when you create an NFT on the blockchain, that seems to give you the undeniable provenance to, to a piece of work, because after all, the blockchain is supposed to be immutable. But how sure are we about the immutability of the blockchain? In, April, uh, in an April 21st, 2021 article in Art News, Tim Schneider describes the NFT theft of Beeple's first 5,000 days. Now, if you're not familiar with it, this is a very famous NFT that sold for about $69 million uh, just in the past couple months. A hacker who goes by the name of Monsieur Poussin, which means Mr. Nobody, has developed a technique that he calls sleep minting. Monsieur Poussin has described his technique as a custom-built smart contract using the ERC-721 standard, but it's missing an unspecified security check. This allows him to create and move tokens from wallet to wallet without the typical required conditions being met. At this time, it is not fully understood how he did it, but it appears to be real. A quote from this article says, what's clear is that Persun is exploiting a flaw in the standard ERC-721 smart contract, which is used by the overwhelming majority of art-related NFTs transacting on the Ethereum blockchain. It is not an easy to see flaw and the effect is not being faked by Photoshop wizardry or some other non-crypto chicanery. The sleep minted Beeple really is minted in Beeple's wallet, and it really is transferred somewhere afterwards. And both of those transactions are memorialized forever on the blockchain. So what is this telling us about the blockchain and specifically what is this telling us about NFTs? Well, the question is, what do you own when you own an NFT? And the T is what's important because T is for token and that's what you've bought. Every legal opinion I found on the internet has said the same thing. NFTs are just that, tokens, and they don't actually confer any real ownership of the underlying art or guarantee any future revenue from future sales. Everything about the ownership, licensing rights, future royalties, and everything, else that is and everything else is governed in the exact same way that those things are handled now, through extensive contracts that cover such items as who actually owns the copyright, reproduction rights, display rights, and any subsequent recompense from future sale of the token. And in the example of Beeple's first 5,000 days, apparently he's maintained the copyright of the image and has not been transferred to the person who paid $69 million for it. The terms controlling these things could be embedded in a smart contract, but they're not necessarily there by default, and they could be superseded by other agreements. Licensing of artwork is complicated and complex, is, is a complicated and complex legal process. And we have to take that into account whenever we're looking at these. From Latham and Wake Watkins, which is a, a law office, law firm. They say, however, a simple NFT by itself cannot help with matching the creator or the owner of an NFT to a real person in the physical world 
nor does it validate that the creator of the NFT has the underlying rights to tie that NFT to any specific creative work. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that NFTs have a lot of hype behind them. Silicon's Val Silicon Valley's biggest product is, a, is hype. As the web was dawning, so was the possibility that we could be in a networked society. When you described your work at the beginning of the web, when, when you would describe your work as a web developer to family back home, they had no, uh, no idea what you're talking about. It felt special and revolutionary. We were defining the future and making it happen. And what was happening, um, I know I do. Uh, we were defining the future and making it happen. So what was, we were, buying into this hype that we were going to build this network, uh, communications network that was going to work in this particular way, no censorship, democratizing, all these things. And the language surrounding blockchain is almost identical to the language that was surrounding the web in the early 1990s. And as we all know, the web has not brought us all the promises that, that we thought it would. So as we look at what's happening with blockchain, we need to think about some of the environmental issues of it. Uh, excuse me, just a moment, getting a little bit dry. The environmental issues of blockchain, it, it's difficult to calculate the power consumption of any blockchain network. It's extraordinarily hard to compute. But there are many different estimates which show that the Bitcoin network to be a very large consumer of electricity. Remember that as each new Bitcoin is minted, the calculations to create the next coin get more complex and difficult to compute, which is the design of, of the system. Estimates for Bitcoin put it around the same size as the entire consumption of Argentina, which is a country of 50 million people. Bitcoin is not supporting an economy of 50 million people, and indeed is not even supporting any economic activity aside from limited currency trading. Another way that to estimate its usage is to compare all the energy used by all the world's data centers and compare it to Bitcoin. And it seems as if Bitcoin is using about 48% of that electricity. Another issue is the chips that drive Bitcoin mining. They're specialized. They're known as Application Specific Integrated Circuits, or ASICs. In 2013, miners switched to these types of chips and they can only perform mining algorithms. This triggered a computational arms race where only the most powerful ASICs can win the competition for new Bitcoins. So when newer versions of the circuits are released, which happens about every 18 months or so, the existing units are rendered obsolete. They are hardwired to mine, and once the new chip is, re is released, they're no longer usable or needed. Finally, the energy consumption question gets routinely swatted away with the argument about moving from proof of work to proof of stake, which is supposed to reduce the amount of electricity used. And for example, in the ether, ether uh, network, it's supposed to reduce the amount of electricity used by about 99% or so. However, there's a paradox known as J. Bond's paradox, and that explains that this could actually lead to more electricity usage and not less. Every development and efficiency for a given technology has the effect of that technology being adopted more widely or used more. This paradox was first described in 1865 by English economist William Stanley J. Bond's. He observed that technological improvements that increase the efficiency of coal use led to the increased consumption of coal in a wide range of industries. He argued that contrary to common intuition, technological pro progress could not be relied upon to reduce fuel consumption. So another way to think about this is with cars. When car fuel efficiency goes up, the cost per mile goes down, thus making it easier and cheaper to drive more miles, thus meaning that you might end up emitting more um, uh, greenhouse gases while doing that. And, from, and we have a quote from Wikipedia uh, about this paradox. This issue has been re-examined by modern economists studying consumption rebound effects from improved energy efficiency. In addition to reducing the amount needed for any given use, improved efficiency also lowers the relative cost of using a resource, which increases the quantity demanded. This counteracts to some extent the reduction in use from improved fuel efficiency. Additionally, improved efficiency increases real incomes and accelerates economic growth, further increasing the demand for resources. Thus, Javon's paradox occurs when the, effect, uh, when the effect from increased demand predominates and improved efficiency 
increases the speed at which resources are used. So another way to think about this, um, and this is a rather snarky review of it, is keeping your car idling for 24 seven to, so, to solve Sudoku's for heroin. Now that's not exactly what Bitcoin, um, that's not what exactly what Bitcoin is doing to people, but they do get entranced by it because it's this kind of devotion uh, to cryptocurrency that is keeping it going. We're only assigning it value because we believe that it has value. And why do we believe that it has value? Because people tell us it has value. Now, what is happening with this value though right now is something that we do need to understand a little bit better. And if you've looked at what has happened specifically in the past week and even specifically today, what's happened with cryptocurrencies is that there has been a spectacular crash. Here we have a chart from Coindesk and we see that the value of Ether in the past week has gone from $4,000 to $2,600. In the same time frame, Bitcoin went from $50,000 a coin to $38,000 a coin. Now, earlier this year, Tesla announced that they would accept Bitcoin as payment for their cars. This happens to coincide with the, right, with the rise of the price of Ether and as NFTs as a popular way to sell art. Approximately a week ago, Tesla announced that they were no longer accepting Bitcoin. Elon Musk has also been very coy in hinting that it might be possible that Tesla has dumped all of their Bitcoin uh, holdings in various tweets that he has had on the past couple of days. These announcements move the entire cryptocurrency market, not just Bitcoin and Ether. And NFTs just also happen to coincide with these movements. So as we've seen, NFTs do not necessarily promise the technological capabilities for smart contracts and ownership that they claim. So the real question is, what is driving the rise of NFTs and what is driving the interest behind them? Uh, especially when you look at what's happened today in the market, uh, there's, there's some very specific questions about building this, this, um, this interest. And then all of a sudden it seems to have all gone away. So that's why um, I sort of think of them as, as NFTs because I think we've been teased with them a little bit. Uh, and my experience with them is, is not much different than selling regular art without the networked uh, certificate. And so that uh, actually concludes my talk for this, for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was so great. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, that was awesome. Um, I like the NFTs. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and also just the, the, the coincident of the, the talk being on the day when the <laughs> market crashed again, again. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was something like a 13% decline today. <laughs> yeah. And one thing I, you and I were talking about earlier, just, I think that's interesting is, you know, if you're on Robin hood and you're, you're trading regular stocks, you have to wait till the market opens and closes in New York. But if you're trading NFT or sorry, if you're trading cryptocurrency, you don't have to wait at all. This is instantaneous. So the way it feels a bit more like a Las Vegas vending machine um, without any night or day. It does. And there was a there was a proposal in Norway to move uh, crypto mining to some of their more green assets so that you're not using fossil fuels. Um, the problem is, is that those assets are in use to power homes and businesses, et cetera, et cetera. So they were talking about using the downtime when they're not using the, the green generation and the crypto world can't use it because it has to be a 24 uh, seven process. So they can't just start and stop because you have to keep going with building the block in a continuous path in a continuous uh, fashion. Yeah. And um, I mean, blockchain can only process something like eight things a second, eight, eight transactions. It's very, not a lot, honestly. Yeah. Um, and that, so, that, yeah. that might actually be on the high end. I've seen estimates as low as three, three. Yeah. Maybe it's three. I don't even know. I am maybe maybe, but the, the fact that it's just, it, they can't actually, it can't really do anything except for be money. Like it, it without, you can't even use it like a credit card. Like it's not even like cash. So um, how, how we're going to trade it and how that, that ledger will work is like a 
way bigger question, which also also makes me wonder what is my like little percentage of blockchain that I have in my account? Like, how is that even who, how is it even uh, kept track of? So who knows? Um, but yeah, just like what you were saying is, you know, there's a lot of different NFT sites. There's um, OpenSea, there's Rarible, there's Foundation, but there's the one that Taiwan actually turned me on to, which is um, Hit Ek Nunk here now. And that one uses Tezos as a yes. currency, which is a lot cheaper. So if you actually want to just start minting without paying crazy gas fees, that's a good one to try. Yeah, the OpenSea gas fees were were quite high. Um but it, because it was the biggest one, I figured that was a good place to kind of start and just see what it'd be like. Yeah, that's where um, I started too. Yeah. Um, I don't see any questions, but also I know it's, this is being live streamed elsewhere and I don't necessarily have that that chat um, availability. I don't know where it is. So- I'll ask, can I ask one question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, with the, the, the hacker that that um, kind of found the, the, the flaw, yes. did- did they now is he is that person still is was it a black hat thing and they got the money and ran away i kind of lost that part of the story or was it more like they discovered the flaw they're trying oh, yes. to help us out like what's the angle on, so on so it was a um i wouldn't call him a pure black hat or a pure white hat um so basically what he did is he he did it he sleep minted um people's uh first five thousand days out of, he got somehow got into people's wallet created a new token, moved it to another wallet and put it on, uh, put up for sale on, I believe, OpenSea and Rarible. And very shortly after that, both OpenSea and Rarible saw that this was, had been minted and posted on their site. So they took it down. And then he released so how, a statement. What was their alarm there? Sorry to interrupt. Like, what was their, what did they catch? Like, they saw the artwork moving elsewhere because it was such a big number or, or like, was it the, the finances? We, what did they see? Um, well, uh, to, to be honest, the article that I quoted didn't, didn't say what specifically they mm -hmm. saw um, mm -hmm. that triggered it, but it just said that they, they took it down very quickly. So it mm -hmm. might've been, it might've been just the fact that it was named Beeple's first 5,000 days, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Cause, cause, cause I mean, cause, I mean, he, the, the hacker didn't hide what he was doing in terms yeah, of yeah. art. He didn't rename it, right? And he right. did release a statement saying that he wanted to point out this flaw. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yeah. There was a, a, what's his name? McCoy, the guy who made one of the first NFTs, um, has looked at the, the code that the hacker has used and he can't figure out how it works. So there have been people looking at it but remember this, that, that article is from April 21st. And this hack happened, I believe like at the beginning of April was the date that I recall from the article. So we're talking something that has happened less than a month ago or within, within a month. Um, so, but the hacker point on, blank. Ongoing, the ongoing investiga investigation. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. But, but the hacker did point blank say that, that there are, he, alludes to other issues with smart contract on, in theor on Ethereum that he wanted to point out. So I have a feeling we might be hearing from him again. Yeah. <laughs> the cool thing is that it did, it did do its job and that it did record the, the transaction. And we do yes. have a, a, a quote unquote paper trail or digital trail. And I think that's um, the value or maybe one of the interesting things about this hack was that it actually got recorded. And I think, well, just from my own personal thesis, I developed in 2018 at the, we had a blockchain based gray area festival where I give a talk. And one of the things that for my research, I think is will be useful with blockchain is supply chain, um, supply chain transactions. Like when you, where does your diamond ring come from? Like what, where was the diamond mine? Where was it sold to what person? Where did it go into the shop? Like the history of products is something that I think we can use blockchain for, or to um, document in a much better way than that will like have retail retailers become more accountable. Um, not that that has happened, but that's like a, I think a cool possibility for the technology um, mm -hmm. uh -huh. to help the environment, but at the risk of running a million computers that are burning up the environment, <laughs> well, you know, so, <laughs> right. so right. devils, anyway, we should probably move to the next talk, but Steve will be on the chat. So if you do have questions, you can chat. Steve on the chat.
All right. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was great. And thanks, uh, Ronnie, for your question. Um, I say you are next. Yay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm also going to let you introduce yourself, but yes, mm -hmm. I see is another member of our incubator and I'm very excited to have her share. Okay. Do you have any audio? Um, a little bit. Actually, you just remember but... to click share computer sound when you present. Okay. Um, I don't think we're going to need audio as much. So, um, let me, um, okay. Share sound. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, I might actually not be able to do that um, because I need to install something, obviously. So probably I'm going to go with without audio. Okay, that's fine. We see your, your presentation now. Great. Okay. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Aisha, and um, today I'm going to be talking about um, nonlinear narrative structures and feminist discourse. Um, a little background about myself. Um, I actually have a very diverse background. Um, I'm a data scientist, artist, and a yoga teacher. Um, and I have been part of Gray Area for almost two years now, um, teaching, learning, uh, thinking, and making art. Um, so I'd like to start my presentation by building um, an analogy with um, a tarot card that I identify myself with. Um, so this is a full card from a very classical tarot deck um, that has been around for 200 years, I believe. And this card specifically has been at the center of almost all of my readings. Um, so this full card is numbered as zero. Uh, and it represents this unlimited potential. Um, so it doesn't have a specific place in the sequence of the tarot cards. Um, as you can see from this visual representation, this card is almost gender fluid. It represents a free spirit, um, curiosity, new beginnings, and, something, and sometimes jumping from one thing to another. Um, in the past few years, um, I've been unfortunately disconnected from this full personality. Um, I've been observing this overly logical, masculine, um, outcome-oriented patterns within me. Um, and thanks to Saturn return, uh, I turned 29 this year. Um, I've been reconnecting with this full side of me again and starting to own back um, some of the feminine uh, free-flowing qualities of mine a little bit more. Um, so it actually makes sense. Um, today, I actually want to talk about what it means to have uh, this nonlinear free-flowing thinking and its relationship to my art-making process. But before we start talking about nonlinear systems or narratives, let's define what linear means. As you can see from this visualization, linear means like a line. And so a linear process moves forward a line. Linear narratives are pretty much the same. They start at a step one, at step one, and complete the task before moving on to the step two. They are very concentrated and indeed very, and indeed very centralized in terms of thinking and structure and creating structures. Um, our world is also structured upon the concept of logic. So we are. Um, from a very early age, uh, you know, like we are very familiar with this way of thinking. We learn math um, to apply some logical processes. We, we learn deductive reasoning to um, apply logic to our lives. Um, so it's almost like an instinct to categorize um, our experiences and make, make projections about the um, outcome. Um, however, 
um, as you can imagine, heavily relying on this single starting point um, just because of its convenience or just because we are used to it can limit us from finding a much better answer. Or simply, the starting point might be wrong. Um, actually, in most of the problems in our political system, also stems from this mismatch of starting points. Also, sometimes we try to overfit or underfit a certain dimension to this mental model to confirm our initial biases um, to pursue a, an unconscious outcome. Nonlinear non thinking, on the other hand, characterized by expansion in multiple directions. So rather than in one direction, and based on the concept that there are multiple starting points from which one can apply logic to a problem, it's less construct constructive. And um, it allows um, more room for, it, it has more room for creativity because of inherent lack of structure. Um, it's kind of like letting that full personality run wild. Um, in this model, anything of interest is in investigated thoroughly before jumping to the next. Um, that next subject or that next um, area of topic could be probably non-related, um, but it's, it's very much like brainstorming allowing thinking, allowing ideas to flow uninterrupted in attempts to arrive upon something special in the process. So um, having multiple starting points obviously increases possible outcomes by not being so certain. Um, I see utility in both, um, both ways of thinking. And I think both of them could be very useful depending on the circumstance. If you are a very fragmented thinker like me, sometimes having a nonlinear approach can potentially make it harder for you to come up with conclusions. But if you have a very clear goal, linear approach could be very efficient as well. Um, speaking of feminist discourse, usually the nonlinear narratives are attributed to um, matriarchal feminine structures and linear narratives are attributed to patriarchal masculine centralized structures. Um, this actually brings me back to feminist discourse again and tarot cards. Um, a few months ago, my tarot reader asked me whether or not I was reading materials that are mostly written by men. When I looked briefly at my bookcase, um, I saw that almost all of the authors that I was reading um, was male <laughs> people. Um, and um, most of the books that I was reading was um, male identified, psycho very heavy psychoanalytical books. Um, and, you know, it was, it was just like a brief uh, moment of enlightenment for me. Um, so by becoming a bit more aware, uh, little by little, um, I started changing my reading habits. And I started reading um, feminine, uh, female writers, especially feminist books. Um, first book I read was Will to Change by Bell Hooks, which really emphasized how masculine structures prevents men from expressing the fundamental emotions of who they are, especially in these productivity outcome focused systems. It's harder for men to feel vulnerable and want to love. Uh, want to love. Um, in the second book, Sarah Ahmed, on the other hand, emphasizes how, again, masculine structures prevents women from expressing the fundamental emotions of who they are, rage, anger, stubbornness, and sometimes pointing out the problem. 
Um, since, since these um, linear systems highly benefit from deductive reasoning, we usually undermine this very fluid nature of gender. Um, so again, part of this year's theme was to bring out some of these more free-flowing mechanisms in place and to my life and make a peace with not sticking to a single medium. Um, and since, again, I work with a lot of me mediums as part of my creative, uh, creative expression, um, having that like goal-oriented mindset was really forcing me to you know, oh, Aisha, like, why are, why are you not choosing this? Like, why don't you have a concentration? Why are you like feeling this urge to like move to the next thing all the time? Um, so it's really part of like this whole process, this whole process is really about um, making a peace with um, being unorganized and being free flowing and not necessarily pursuing an outcome. So these are some of the mediums that I use um, as part of my creative expression. Data science, UI UX, photography, pottery, teaching, audio, yoga and meditation, drawing, projection mapping. Um, and um, obviously I'm not attached to a specific outcome, um, but I usually observe that um, my subconscious usually explores some of the themes like feminist discourse, nonlinear narratives, experimental art, collaboration and community. Um, so here are some examples from my previous work um, with photography. As you can see, it's very experimental. I like to put um, little pieces of my photography together. Um, it's very nonlinear way of telling a story or like by not focusing on a theme. Um, but I, I, I think it gives you an idea about the big picture. Um, this is uh, an example from um, one of the projects I've done as part of my Creative Code Immersive, uh, which is a MIDI controlled mixed media. Um, in this one, um, you know, all of the notes and the synthesizer and the middle controller are mapped to uh, images, but the sequences of those images are not relying on a certain theme as well, or they are not like representing a theme or of, of some sort. They are kind of like all over the place. Um, this is an experimental video oops, um, I've done. Um, as part of my last year's incubator project. It was designed to be a projection mapping project, but due to COVID, um, it was published in web. Um, it does not have the best uh, quality because I took a screen recording, um, but um, as you can see, it's very experimental. Um, and when I was creating this, it was actually, um, I didn't pursue a specific outcome, although I had something in mind. Um, I also see teaching as a creative practice too. Um, and I taught some courses, um, again, here at Gray Area, um, and I'm really grateful uh, for having the platform to teach. Um, and the courses that I thought really influenced how I want to continue making art, um, sometimes silly, sometimes unstructured and experimental, um, but it's always, you know, like, like even the nature of teaching has this like collaborative, fun environment, environment for me. And that really um, informs what I want to do next. Um, so, on the left hand side, there are some data visualization <laughs> examples I created for um, my data visualization design Plotly and Python course uh, workshop at Gray Area Festival last year. I really enjoyed creating the curriculum. Uh, both teaching and designing the course was very rewarding for me. 
And it's the same case with projection mapping. Last semester, I taught the projection mapping class for our immersive program. Collaboratively, we had a lot of time, a lot of fun time exploring. Um, so I want to show um, some of the examples of my students, because again, I think I see them as part of my art making and I see them as part of, um, you know, they are also influence, influencing me and teaching me too. Um, so this is an artwork by May Rose. Um, it was actually Halloween time when I was teaching the course. So most of them has this like a specific uh, focus on punk, like working with pumpkins. Um, their work is actually, May's work is actually super cool and very non-linear. They made an interactive dress. It has a pumpkin face in the middle and it reacts to sound. Um, this is mm -hmm. Alexis Pumpkins, um, Alexandra Harker. She paint, painted pumpkins with light and made very cool decorations. This is um, another <laughs> adorable project by Alex. Uh, it's not very concept driven. Um, she was just experimenting with ways to make video projections more interactive for her daughter. Um, she used Mad Mapper, Conductive Ink, and Featherboard, Featherboard to come up with these cool visuals. Yes. Oh, yeah, it's a with the elephant? With elephant? What letter is the elephant? Hmm. This. Yeah, the letter E. Ah. Ah. It goes to the A. We're friends. It's the same. Same. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think, um, as you can see, these are all of my influences and they're kind of like all over the place. Um, but the next thing that I want to do is really sticking with this free form of making art without a pursuit outcome and having that be my statement. Um, in the past few months, I've been painting a lot of furniture um, and making a lot of pottery, um, doing some glazing. And until June, I'd like to finish building underlying forms that I can inform the technology with. Um, I want to combine projection mapping with, um, you know, like pottery, or like I want to like paint some furniture um, and projecting onto those surfaces um, and experiment with projections um, that I'm using on that surface. Um, again, having those different types of systems of um, like um, using the medium, earth informing technology, underlying form informing the dynamic static form, um, you know, um, is built on, like ever-changing is built on something static, um, technology built on grounded, sustainable, nurturing form. So it's, it has the elements of both masculine and feminine. And I do see value in this. Um, this is a great, um, great text um, that I, when I was reading, when I was doing some um, research about this like nonlinear thinking systems, I was reading some articles and this is part of one of the articles that I um, came across uh, with. Um, it, it talks about like female writers and, you know, like talks about um, feminist writers like Virginia Woolf. If you ever read a story of Virginia Woolf, you can tell, although it's like structured, um, 
within the whole, like when you talk about the whole story, sometimes you don't necessarily make sense of it um, at the very first glance. So she says, although the woman in the text may be the particular woman white writer in the, in the case of 20th century woman experimental writers, the woman in the text is also an effect of the textual practice of breaking patriarchal fictional forms, the radical forms, non-linear, non-hierarchical and decentering are in themselves a way of writing the feminine. Um, so I, with this quote, I wanna um, summarize my talk, um, but um, with uh, something, with, with something personal. Um, so this is my uh, sister's work. Uh, her name is Jan Su. She lives in Istanbul um, and, I, and I created some of her work and created this nonlinear um, narrative by using the photographs she took uh, for a very um, special project of hers. Uh, she shared them with me. She doesn't usually share this work. Um, so I thank her uh, here. It's a very personal story, but I, I would like to go through this narrative um, and close my talk. Um, so this is uh, by the words of my sister. She says, um, I took the first photographs of, photograph of this series about four years ago with my analog camera. You can see only an eye of whom I photographed, Zerin. She was my only close friend at film school those days. After one year, I took this photograph. Zerin and her older sister, Betul, were shot and killed by Zerin's husband. Before the bodies were sent to be buried in their hometown, Samsun, they were brought to where they lived and died one last time. I remember only a few things from that day. One day, one of them is a veil that covered Betul's coffin. She never got married, but in Anatolia, it's a tradition to bury women with their reins if they were never married. Ironically, when I think about Betul, this scene is the first thing that comes to my mind. I dropped out of school after this instance. A year ago, I started getting interested in photography again. While I was browsing the archive, I found this, very, I found this first photograph and decided to create a series. I used curtains because when we were kids, my sister and I thought of them as imaginary whales. Thank you. Thank you, I say. That was so moving. And I'm really glad you shared that story about your sister's work with us at the end. Um, and repped feminist nonlinear discourse. Um, <laughs> does anyone have any questions for about any of this for I say before we move on, just because that was a lot of time? But I want to make sure if there are questions that, um, yeah, you get a chance to ask them. It's such a somber ending. I'm like, I'm just talking quietly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the cat photos didn't help necessarily. Part of yeah. non-linear. 
and um, you can see your work. Maybe you should put your link to the Veils piece mm -hmm. in the chat mm -hmm. because that way people can look at the photos. Okay, yeah. Okay. Your website is isaydemir.com, is that correct? Mm hmm Cool. Thank you. And yeah, you guys should all check out those photos. Oh, there we go. Um, okay. Next up, who is next? We have Stephanie Andrews. Hey, Steph. Hey. Uh, setting up screen sharing. All right, uh, can you see the presentation okay? Yes. Awesome, thanks Nikki. Um, so my talk is called Joys, Kits and Benches and it's mostly um, a bit about my practice and a few projects I have in progress. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Um, I'm an artist and experience designer and I also am one of the instructors of the Creative Code Immersive here at Gray Area. I often make weird sentimental art games and playful tactile installations that respond to emergent and speculative issues and that explore economies of care and communication. Uh, so thank you again for joining us today. And um, I'm mostly sharing about my practice through a selection of prior works, things I've been thinking about lately and a few projects that I've been working on. Um, so some recent work and things of interest. I uh, really like utilizing the spaces between and beyond physical artifacts themselves. I enjoy making work that is both about and a medium for tactile creative space sharing and for collective placemaking using a variety of raw materials from wood, acrylic, fabric, and plaster to webcams, motors, mini PCs, and the internet at large. So I created this work here a couple years ago out of wood and acrylic. And this was my first attempt at making something modular, adaptable, compressible, and very small in form factor, yet hopefully expansive in experience. And the physical artifact of this work measured roughly one foot by one foot um, by like a couple inches, but was able to encourage groups of up to five people at a time to co-create new overlapping translucent structures that with light would project shapes and colors to the surrounding environment. And this was another related installation exploring the expansive capacities of compact forms. So this installation was a collaboration with my collective partner, Jimmy, and was developed as a physical and audiovisual tool facilitating collaborative composition, communication, and the physical exploration of sound and space. I'm also very interested in exploring the agency and capacities of people, of communities, and of systems, and of all forms of healing using a lens of care and magical realism, a touch of science and simulation, and a reverence for duration, process, and personal, institutional, and communal memory. This um, installation from last year, called An Immersive Game of Life, touches on many of these themes. It was an immersive reimagining of Conway's Game of Life that transforms a traditionally 2D simulation by adding lushness, physicality, and interactivity to illustrate the self-regulating and interrelated properties of both people and systems. This installation was produced in collaboration with Gray Area's Experiential Space Research Lab last spring. Uh, and later in 2020, shortly after deinstalling that last work, and around the time the world began to really fall apart, uh, I started to explore creating art that could be experienced physically and distantly, and that could share and engender hope during what for me felt like um, a really hopeless time. So um, this work is called A Starter Kit for Alchemical Wishes, uh, and was a small gift I mailed to another artist made of cardstock, seed paper, tape and intangibles, along with suggested instructions for how to use the kit. So first make a wish with action and intention, then transmute that wish with water, soil and sunlight, and finally wait with presence and care. And for every moment that could use a little more hope, I wanted this artist, Linda, to be able to tear off seed paper and plant it someplace, knowing maybe one day it could become something grand, that it was okay if it never sprouted there, the process itself of carefully engaging is what creates the magic of hope. I uh, then created this next work, The Artist's Box, around the same time. I'm in a small group of artists around the world who've been mailing each other gifts like this. Uh, so just reading the note I put inside, uh, I'm just gonna, okay. 
kind of zoom in a little bit. Um, so this is a gift of choice, chance, and experience. A choose your own adventure sort of offering from one artist to another, filled with glimpses of everyday items that have gradually made their way into my own creative rituals. I've carefully curated and crafted this to share a bit more of my world with you. If you have received this box, I invite you to take whatever and however many paths you'd like through it, and only request that you consider placing a renewal offering of any form into terminal boxes that have been fully experienced and consumed. Uh, so I wanted to give the experience of gifts, and part of what I and many uh, people I know enjoy most is receiving a gift, about it's receiving a gift is actually unboxing and discovering what's inside. Um, rather than the actual contents itself. So I made a box where at each juncture, there were a few other nested boxes to open. And within each of those boxes, more boxes, basically turtles all the way down, until finally there were small interactive sensorial offerings to experience, consume, and replace. In one of the terminal boxes, I had cut up a poem and put, in it, with, put it in with some tape contained in another box, with another poem embedded uh, fully constructed underneath the tape. Um, in another box, I had some chocolate and yet another a small scent sampler. If I recall correctly, there were about 16 boxes altogether. After I sent this off, the artist that received it consumed a few things from it and put in her own then sent it off again to another artist. I personally really enjoy making work like this. So work that is truly and solely about the experience and about relinquishing ownership to the world at large and to other people. And even if it's a tiny bit heartbreaking to see the work I carefully put together um, over, over weeks get gradually taken apart and consumed uh, and no longer be like this careful form that I've crafted. That's also what I hope people will do with my work in general, um, to take it apart and really make it their own. Uh, so I next just want to share a few works that have inspired me in recent months. So perhaps unsurprisingly, I'm really into flux kits and a lot of my work nowadays is around reimagining what a flux kit can be. Uh, for those unfamiliar, flux kits are essentially small boxes of inexpensive materials assembled for personal use made during the 1960s and 70s, um, commonly known to be assembled by this artist George uh, Masiunas, with components made by a large group of Fluxist artists of the era. So from a can of beans packed with facts about beans printed on small scrolls, fastened with elastic, to contiguous plastic compartments filled with light bulbs and candles, they truly are textures of everyday life. And they're intentionally non-precious sensory experiences with parts that can be handled and replaced. So here on the left um, is a flux kit assembled by George Masiunas, and on the right, another artist's arrangement of a flux kit that in this display served uh, as a work of art itself. And uh, here is another example of a flux kit along with a list of all the artists that contributed to it. The last precedent I wanna share with you all is Reddit gifts. So this is an online gift exchange where you can randomly get paired to trade things like stickers and condiments and snacks and even automobiles somehow with people around the world. Um, so this is a type of experience that I like that really inspires me and that makes me feel like uh, like the world is not is, is both big and yet like still very intimate and personal. So this all ties into my newest works in progress, durational, collective, participatory and experiential pieces. Um, one project I've been working on lately, is an immersive installation sharing sights and experiences of joy. It's an audiovisual piece made specifically for the multi-screen cine chamber here at Gray Area, and one that will hopefully culminate in an ever-changing collective archive of immersive, calming, and uplifting media to experience live. To me, the process of creating this all is at least just as important as the final outcome. In the past few months, I've been gradually filming at local sites that ground me, and I've begun inviting a few other friends and collaborators to join me in sharing the round. So I'm gonna replay the video again. Uh, this video is from an internal recording uh, from a recent screen test at, on site at Gray Area. I kind of filmed it very quickly, so sorry about that. Uh, 
And this next project, um, Project Mixtape, is a simple collaborative audio project that shares resilience and resilient practices of QTPOC folks. It was partially born out of an interest in experiential data and seeks to capture intangible attributes and experiences like resilience. It's essentially an archive of audio recordings of folks engaging in intimate restorative practices, a personal consensual offering, opening up and sharing whatever practice is healing for them through sound for others to actually experience in some form. Uh, and so far this uh, project has just sort of started as a seedling with me and like a few other um, collaborators around the area. But I'm hoping eventually like once more of it has um, come together and there's a clear physical form to actually invite other artists to. And finally, uh, I'm really into benches. I've had absurdly long talks with other artists about benches. I've long held an interest in furniture design and in particular in modular, movable and ephemeral forms, which I envision culminating in a bunch of benches you might see on a corner or underpass near you one day. I generally really appreciate furniture's capacity to create new space and to suggest new ways to engage and belong. So my last year was filled with deep isolation, stress and despair, um, as I imagine many others uh, could potentially relate to. And for the first time in a long while, I just couldn't find joy in any place or anything. And I really struggled emotionally to produce new work and to move forward during a time where everything was collapsing and all the resilience I believed I possessed was gone. But despite all this, I decided throughout my stupor in Catatonia to not let my life entirely implode. And I forged forward and eventually with the support of a few incredible friends, Mads and Therapy, began going through the motions of things that normally could bring me joy. And it was through that that I started thinking, if there was no happiness to discover, I needed to really focus on creating it for myself and abstract others who might one day resonate with my work creating serendipity and new contacts and environments for others to do the same. And that's really what got me through, what got grounded me, and what informed the works I shared with you today. Anyways, thank you again for joining me in this hall tonight. I put my contact, contact information on this slide. Um, and if you ever would like to contribute to any of my collaborative projects, please do reach out. I'm always happy to chat with and support other artists because making art can be quite isolating. And I really appreciated the gray area community and the folks in this incubator, especially for just making that feel like um, just a lot, a lot more of a, a community. Um, so that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. That was awesome. Um, are you going to make actual cassette tapes? We have a question. Oh, yes. Uh, well, sort of. So my plan is I'm going to basically have a bunch of recordings uh, and have like a digital like space for it, but also I'm working on like a sculptural thing where I'll actually have uh, small like cassette tapes that will be hooked to some servos or motors that will run so that you can kind of plug into it like conceptually, but it won't actually be recorded on the tapes. Um, nice. So my hope is like when people actually start uploading eventually once I develop it more, uh, mm -hmm. that like whatever people on site experience could be um, what like is currently being shared online. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and I really appreciate like, since I've known Stephanie who also was originally in our incubator and then became an, I mean, in our, the immersive, then became an incubator member, then a teacher, like your um, dedication to collaboration, which is something after my own heart, which oh. I, I really love. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, this is like a very up and down. It's like my order for the salon. I it was like, it's like you know, up and down emotional roller coaster. So I'm really excited about it. Um, <laughs> does anyone else have another question about <clears throat> what uh, Stephanie just shared with us? If you do, you can speak up or put it into the chat. We do have one comment. Very heartening. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Probably. Yeah, yeah. So beautiful. The ice for my sake. Um, no, really great work. I'm so happy you're in the incubator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and I'm excited to see the big screen cine chamber piece when it comes. I'm most excited about the benches. <laughs> <laughs> Beyond the benches, I hope that you actually, you just don't worry about liability. It's fine. Um, <laughs> says a person that is not a lawyer. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, we have another 
this is a light, more lighthearted presentation. We have Stuyash Joshi, who is going to perform for you, not just talk. This is, there's more going on. Oh yeah, set the mood, Stuyash, set the mood. <laughs> you're muted, you're muted. Welcome everyone, so excited to see you all here. Uh, today I'm gonna to give you a sneak preview of what's coming uh, and I'll, I'll give you a little demo as well. So let me start my screen share. Do, do, do. So you um, can see my screen, right, everybody? Yes. Perfect, perfect. So yeah, my name is Suyash, and I'm uh, thrilled to be part of this salon. Actually, the whole incubator with such talented artists, it's always amazing to see their work and, and share my work and get feedback and from the instructors, including Nikki and others. So who am I? I love a couple of things are my passion and I want to kind of bring a lot of them together in this project, this, this, uh, you know, a few months that we're working on this project. Juggling and poi is one of the things I love to do. I don't know if there are any jugglers or poi spinners or performance artists in the house, put, put it in the chat. Uh, I'd love to connect with you. I also love to do magic tricks. Uh, since I was a kid, I always love to do magic tricks. And of course, you know, day job got me into coding and, and design and then, you know, uh, inspired by the community. So a few things I've done. Well, here is my uh, Instagram. Let me actually uh, fix something here. Uh, the Zoom thing that pops up. Um, yeah, uh, here is, if you want to follow me, follow me on Instagram. I, I post, you know, stuff that I do that I'm passionate about. And uh my big moment was last year, I got to perform a magic trick for none other but Steve Wozniak and his wife and, his, and their dog <laughs> as part of his birthday. It was actually a, a competition that I won and then I got a 15 minutes of fame with him and I did a magic trick, so he enjoyed it. And I got a, a watch signed by him, which I'm wearing right there, Apple Watch. So with that said, got me motivated because I that was the first time when I combined magic trick and an IoT. What I have is IoT microcontroller. And uh, maybe one day I'll show you that magic trick. But today I want to talk about flow arts. Flow arts, uh, or you can think of dance, audiovisual performances. I've taken a lot of workshops around these and I think I've now realized what I really want to present or produce, perform, you can say. I've been inspired by a lot of people there's a famous uh, community here called Kinetic Arts. They're dancers and artists come along and they do a dance hack day. I was participated there. We have a fantastic juggling and flow arts community in San Francisco. We meet in Dolores Park every Sunday. <clears throat> a lot of creative people. Uh, and you might have seen some of the performances like this one. There's a performer you know, performing and they, their body is being captured by some kind of system, generally something like a Kinect depth sensor. And then you can visualize that in various creative ways. So, I mean, that is pretty cool, right? Uh, this is something recently I saw um, by Google. Bill uh, T. Jones, famous choreographer, dancer, working with AI technology. Technology, it's called PoseNet. It tracks your, your body without needing connect or any fancy hardware. You can do it from your webcam, right? It's become so easy these days, but there are challenges and I'll talk about that. But then imagine if you can track the body, what can you do here? They're animating text. And then, you know, text, you can, you can share ideas, express your thoughts, emotion, have a whole poetry with a dance performance. So this was very inspiring. Um, also inspires me is the flow arts community. Um, people, they spin these props, they juggle in book that talks about Zen of juggling, which is, you know, do, people who do these things, they are just doing it for the intrinsic pleasure. Some, you know, some minority are performers who perform at stage and they get paid. A lot of them you'll see in the park or Burning Man or you go to a beach. They just, love, just like dancing, you know, it's just fun. So, 
what I want to do is I want to have keep that spirit of that free flowing or, or state of flow. But I also want to combine it with technology, technology so that it it creates some kind of a audiovisual effect like this, or as you can see in this picture, um, and something that's generative, you know, not, not deterministic. It has some kind of agency and perhaps even interactive. So based on the choreography of, of the performer, either visual changes or their musical sound effect that changes. So how does one go about doing that? I mean, there are a lot of things. It's, it's a system that I'm trying to make. So it's not just for me, but anyone could use it. Um, so, uh, you know, there are various ways you can go about it. First is, okay, th these are all performance art practices. Are there systems that where I can codify them? You know, if I have to program it, I can leverage something. Uh, that uh, system that represents these art forms. So there are there are notations for dancers. There are ways to notate music, right? Uh, and then there are notation for jugglers. So jugglers would be juggle, you know, whatever props, ball, clubs, rings. There, there, there is a system we call five three one or four uh, four two one or various notation. They mean each of them mean a pattern because they represent it. Ball needs to come from this arm. It needs to go up higher or lower. Uh, so, so they've codified these things because without this, we are kind of just free flowing and it's become hard to invent or, or, or study this thing scientifically so that, you know, if we want to uh, write an algorithm or, or uh, do a deeper research into it. So, so luckily these things have been codified and my, Half the work is done, but the half the work is you have to have to put them in a programmable like a system. So uh, for tracking, the first challenge is I want to track the person. And I not only want to track the person, I also want to track the objects or the props. In this picture, you're seeing a, a web camera, which is it has two cameras. One is the regular, what we call RGBA camera, other one is a depth camera, which you also may find in the Kinect or even on your iPhone in your selfie mode that, you know, where it can track your face to unlock. It's a depth camera, uses infrared technology. So I played with this, but I realized that it was kind of not very good. And it created a bulky system because it was tied to a laptop. I had to create, take this thing and I have to take my laptop around and then I have to stand in front of it. It has to be well lit so it can recognize me and then the props. And then there's an approach called blob tracking. And to track blobs, there are various ways to do that. One popular way is to track the color. So if I can program or write the code to track the orange, you know, RGBA value of orange, and in that frame, it will track that ball or whatever color you want to track. <clears throat> Problem was, it wasn't very responsive. So there is another approach these days, very popular using deep learning. And that allows you to track these the whole body, first of all, um, by web camera, like we saw. So uh, I Googled that pre-trained models for this, and I found something. And I, I, my background has been in mobile development. I've done Android development. So I said, OK, let me put that in an Android app. So why don't I show you um, real quick? Uh, so let's just do this. I'm going to set up my Android phone um, and start start a program that will show us the Android device. All right, so as you can see my Android device here, uh, let me make it bigger. All right, I'm gonna go in front of the, I'm off my Android phone and uh, I'm gonna flip the camera to the front camera and you can see, Perfect, and there I am. Now, uh, here is here is a playing card, and this program, this model is trained to detect a few things, you know, including card. And I can I can show you the card, and it creates this bounding box in front of it. Um, and I can use a different prop, such as this ball. You know, we use this for juggling. We use this for like contact juggling and all kind of fun stuff. Uh, and if I bring it in focus, 
you should yeah, start tracking it. And there it is. There is a challenge though. The challenge is the system loses tracking pretty quickly, which is bad, which is, so what I'm sharing with you is not a final version. It's, it's a work in progress. The challenge is that I'm trying to solve. This is another prop that I want to track a ring. Um, it's very hard because it's right now it's, it's trained to track multiple things. Um, so the way I'm looking to fix this is by training a model, by providing a lot of pictures of this. And I just wanted to track rings. So let's say if I'm, if I'm juggling rings, I should be, it should be able to track not just one, but all of these, if not loose tracking. So um, let me do should you pose estimation. Now this is what we would, uh, this is your connect, connect on your Android phone. You can even find model for your iPhone. And it is actually pretty good. So this one, if you would see, it's grabbing all of my skeleton, including my face, you know, my legs, arms, and I can move, you know, whatever I want to do. And it doesn't lose my tracking. It's pretty good. So here's something, here's what I'm, what I'm going, going towards. What I like to do is I want to be able to not only track the body, which is interesting, but also track the props. Here, what I have is called poi. These are poi balls. And imagine if I'm, if I'm a flow artist and I'm, you know, I'm doing various patterns with the flow toys. As you can see, it's proving really fast. Um, so the challenge is how do I go about tracking an object that's moving this fast? As you saw, playing card or ball, and if I'm just you know, doing, doing manipulation in front of the camera, maybe okay, but uh, something like this very hard. So how does one go about solving that? Because if I can solve these things, 90% of the work is done. After that, all I have to do is take this data, translate this data, and sonify it. So I can create music based on various parameters, how I'm moving, or I can create visual effects. Uh, so I can do a lot of different things. So I'm gonna stop this and go back to my slides. Uh, well, actually, give me a second, let me uh, uh, da -da -da, go to slides. And uh, actually I got a, screen share again and uh, do 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 so what i was talking about i left you with showing you i was moving this ball really really fast and it's going to be very hard to track that through vision system so the other approach i call inside out tracking which is what if i put a microcontroller in this picture it's an adafruit product called circuit playground and it has something called an accelerometer, which can detect X, Y, Z motion. It has other things like a speaker and, you know, it, it comes with a program that you can, you know, send MIDI data to it. And I can create a little music based on acceleration or whatever threshold values I want to set. So that's nice. But the problem with this one is that I have to, I, it, the cable uh, has to, for it to send data to my computer, I have to connect it to my computer through micro USB, which doesn't work. The speaker is too small. I, it can work independently, but nobody will hear it. So the version two of this approach was, okay, um, I ordered a Bluetooth version of the same product. It, they made a newer model. And that was nice because it, it was able to send the data to, a, uh, to an iPhone and I could see the data on the iPhone. Um, and now, uh, you know, through Bluetooth, I can get the data on my computer. And that's where I could sonify the data or I could change some other values, you know, in some other system, let's say max MSP to generate visual uh, graphics and project them on the screen behind me. So now slowly, slowly we're coming to building some kind of a system that I'm, you know, that. I'm visualizing or envisioning. Um, so the challenges I'm right now facing is how do I track multiple objects in real time with high latency, with low latency? An interactive and generative visual. This is the next step. I'm, you know, 
pretty confident in this. And then audio, uh, audio. I'm, I'm new to audio, so I have to look around. What kind of, you know, can I? What kind of effects can I do in audio? Maybe I can add some effects. Maybe you can give me some ideas. Put it in the chat. Change the pitch of the music or volume or other properties. So that's the idea. I hope you would come back to see the final showcase on June 23rd. I'll have a performance and do a live performance. I'll also share video recorded on social media. You can follow me. If you have any questions, please email me. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, yeah, my name is Suyash. Thank you, Suyash. Um, somebody says filtering based on speed for an idea in the chat. Thank you for doing a cool demo. Thanks. Showing us your, <laughs> it actually was really good, like capturing your uh, skeleton. I was impressed. The pose net. Yeah, it's, it's it's good. It is good. Um, it just needs data. The more data it has, and then you know, um, there are other challenges with performances. So, but technology is coming. You don't need to buy Connect anymore. You can do these things on your phone or your computer. I know it's crazy. I'm super stoked. So you're going to move forward with the trying to work with the circuit playground method. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I think you guys gave me ideas, get the data, send it through OSC. That mm -hmm. was a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And I think that it will work hopefully with as close to real time, you know, as, as it can for, for generating audio or changing audio tracks. Um, it's a good device, the Circuit Playground. I've talked with it a lot. Okay. Does anyone else have questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah, you have a lot of comments in here. Posnet is awesome. Nice live demo. Whoa. Okay. So, so cool. <laughs> so, yeah, very great, great work, Suyash. And um, thank you for, for sharing that. It's like a good vibes kind of thing. Stephanie's giving you applause. Um, so I can't wait to see what you do. And we hopefully will be having an in-person showcase and we'll have a digital one, but that means that San Francisco people, you can come or Bay Area people, you could come see it, um, hopefully on June 23rd, but we're working some stuff out with this recombinant media lab Cine chamber. So we're trying to like connect them. So we're, that's kind of all a little bit up in the air about when exactly it'll be stay tuned, um, for that. And that's like a final kind of showing of the work, um, that will hopefully be in June. And next up, we have Tywin, who Tywin Kelly, who's been writing a lot of cool stuff for us on Medium about many things. Um, and I'm very excited to see what you are going to share. Thank you. Um, also, thank you for inviting me to this. I'm not in the incubator, but uh, it's been so inspiring listening to, listening to everyone show their work and, and listening to their ideas. So and uh, my presentation will not be as dynamic as Suyash's, unfortunately. I will be sitting down the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but you will be teaching us about yeah. photography and image processing, which is very important. Yes. So let me share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> uh, great. So let me go back a slide. Uh, yeah, my name is Tywin Kelly. Uh, I, I'm an artist based in Seattle, Washington. Uh, I've long had an interest in photography and film. I studied film and media studies in my undergrad, but in parallel, I've had this sort of separate interest in computers and playing in computers. And only recently I've started to like converge the two together and play with them. Um, so this is an example of an art piece, which I'll explain more later, sort of like a teaser. I want to do some uh, other stuff first. Um, but yeah, I, today I want to talk about computational photography and my past six months investigating, researching, and experimenting using art uh, on this topic. Um, so I think, yeah, just give a rundown. I'll give some examples of what computational photography even is, just so we're on the same page. Uh, and then I'll jump into some experiments that I conducted to help my understanding. I'll walk through my thought process there. And finally, I have these like thesis theses that I iterated through throughout my experiments that I want to like uh, enumerate and expand on and show like how they progressed through each other. And then hopefully you'll come away with an understanding of computational photography and what it is. So this is my cheap sort of cheeky definition of computational photography. Um, 
in my idea, computational photography is all about how an image is processed. And if during that processing of the image, the software out influences the optics, then that for me defines computational photography. So if you take an image with like a DSLR or just a point and shoot digital camera, that for me is not really computational photography because those cameras are designed to sort of emulate their analog film counterparts. They're the, the film CMOS CCD sensors are really just sort of to emulate uh, 35 millimeter film and just turn noise into a signal, right? So what is computational photography? This is a diagram that I've made. And for me, these are the five pillars of the types of computational phot photography out there. Um, you can think of it like a flavor chart, kind of. <laughs> so I'll, I'll run through all of these really quickly and give examples of each. So this first one I call a time mosaic. And it's really any image process that takes it as an input, uh, images taken over time. So if you ever use night mode, excuse me, on one of the new newer smartphones, iPhone, Android, I think they all have them. What's essentially happening is you're taking multiple images over time, varying exposure, um, and, and what you're doing is you're aligning them afterwards, compositing them, picking parts of the image that are sharp or brighter than others, and uh, layering them so that you have the least amount of noise. And what you get is sort of hyper-real, high dynamic range image derived from a kind of long exposure or smart long exposure. So that's an example of the time image, or sorry, time mosaic. And uh, the counterpart to that is a space mosaic. So instead of taking through time, you're actually taking images across space. Uh, this technique is called photogrammetry that I'm showing here. And you basically take your own database of images in consecutive order and such that the images sort of overlap. And photogrammetry software can look at the similarities between two images and triangulate the um, parallax, in a sense, they can infer depth between two images as long as they're similar enough. And what you basically get is a 3D model by just taking flat 2D images. It was kind of a magical process. And since I'm actually going to talk about this more, I'll throw these examples out there. Um, the, uh, of course, photogrammetry today is used in film, uh, in, in Hollywood, and in video games as to, to create like hyper realistic, uh, hyper realistic assets. But it's also used in business, agriculture, construction, landscaping, as well as in the medical field. So here, example of like scanning someone's mouth to get like a proper denture fitting, right? <laughs> um, so there's, there's, it's, it's definitely out there and being used. Uh, another uh, pillar is extrasensory. So a lot of computational photographer, photography takes or uses hardware that operates at a wavelength that we can't normally see. So tomography scans, or, or on the bottom the left is a point cloud generated from like a LIDAR or time of flight sensor on a self-driving car. And on the bottom right, we have like thermal imaging captured from drones, which is very useful for farmers to understand how their crops are doing. Um, another pillar is generative. And this for me just means purely computer generated imagery. So I like to pro provide this example. I, this cover of the IKEA catalog is actually not a photograph. It is um, completely 3D rendered. And actually 75% of the catalog is not made of traditional photographs, as you might imagine they are. 3D rendering, mostly because it's cheaper, uh, easier to manipulate, et cetera. But um, and another example of generative is like sort of generative adversarial networks where you can create these realistic images from a data set that just, and, and make completely brand new uh, images. So this is, these are faces of people that do not exist from this website that that was kind of clever. Um, the last, uh, pillar is uh, segment, or sorry, uh, semantic, and this is really about the um, relationship between image and label. So, and, and the, actually, in the game example that Suyasha showed, that that would definitely fit into the semantic pillar, right? Um, because it's taking an image and posing it and labeling the, the 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 person. And so here I have the segmentation, which is defining the outline of an object. Um, and then we have like a motion detection and all this of course relies on large databases and run through a machine learning algorithm and convolutional neural networks. So that's like, that was a fire hose of stuff, right? And that's sort of the point. <laughs> uh, it's because computational photography is everywhere um, and all around us. And this is sort of the feeling that I had. And this is my first sort of epiphany and thesis is that, wow, it's just all around me. Um, it exists at every scale, and it's on our phones, it's in institutions, it's in science, 
it's in, in the commercial space. Um, and so this is the feeling I was coming away with. <laughs> this is a still from Mr. Bean, which is one of my favorite TV shows. Um, but what we can see is that he's covered his whole apartment in newspapers. And for me, that was kind of like a symbolic metaphor for the way media and in particular computational photography media is just covering every surface. It's on our screens, it's in print media, it's, it's like in the air. And this is like something that I just feel and I want to investigate more. So this is this idea was the impetus of my first experiment. Um, and so this is a, a AR filter for Instagram um, and is titled Behind the Scenes. It basically takes all that jargon I was throwing at you earlier and that, that I researched about these computational photography concepts, uh, algorithms, um, processes, and places on the face of, of the participant. So in a sense, they are wearing the concepts that make this face tracking thing possible in the first place. Um, and so that was a kind of an act in like exposing and revealing this sort of Mr. Bean world <laughs> to, to the participant. But for me, that didn't quite get to the idea that computation, computational photography is everywhere. And so I kept on iterating. It's like, no, 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 computational photography is somewhere. And that's when I decided to um, uh, travel and since I'm in the Pacific Northwest, there are lots of uh, data centers out here, namely along the Columbia Gorge, there's a lot of cheap electricity and I'm sure some tax uh, incentives. But I did like a couple day road trip and went out to like, here you see the Google data center, Microsoft, I think this is the Intuit data center, Amazon, um, Apple, Facebook, uh, the, all, all the large companies. And there's this sort of composition where I um, place my tripod in front of graphically below the data center and as if the data center had kicked off usurped the the camera the, the, where the spot of the traditional camera in a sense taking its place and I was doing a lot of reading, reading at the time where like I learned there we upload about 500 million uh, images to social media platforms every single day which doesn't include like the derivative images like proxy files thumbnails um temporary files other metadata like 500 million images a day and that, that sort of massive scale i think i was trying to capture i was inspired by artists like evan roth and trevor palin and jenny odell who actually i, I learned to learn about through some gray area people um and so i I was, I was pretty happy with this project but i still wasn't fully engaged with it because I felt there's this anal analytical distance with the subject. I was just kind of taking photos of data centers and not really engaging with it. Um, so I went back and I started uh, reading some critical studies about, uh, about media studies in general, um, images, cinema, screen studies, digital worlds, and post-lens post -lens photography. Um, and I started for myself to really flesh out this notion that, okay, for computational photography isn't just made up of technical stuff. There's like a almost like a politics to it where it has like social political political uh, implications and it has this it has like a landscape of its own and i started having making this sort of diagram which i won't really explain it's a little unreadable but <laughs> it, it, the way that images have a class within themselves and interact with each other uh, really inspired me and to iterate on my next thesis which was that computational photography has a mass so as i was thinking about photography more as this thing with depth uh, I kept on coming to this idea of it has, having a mass, meaning it has a weight in our lives and also connotes a thing that's distant, but also very close. So for instance, like the earth is a massive object, but we still have a relation, intimate relationship with it, even though we don't know every part of it. We haven't been to every square inch of the earth, but we still very, feel very close to it. And that's what I felt like I was getting to with computational photography is like this earth sized thing, which I was close to, but um, and it had like this gravity, this mass, but I just didn't quite fully understand. And it's so around the same time I was playing with photogrammetry, which is what I mentioned earlier. And I saw, like, I almost had like a moment again, like I saw the, this as a literal manifestation of what, like what mass means um, and stuff having weight. So this, I was out on a hike in, I think, Eastern Oregon backpacking trip and Someone had a drone and I asked to scan this, the mountain. I think we we're in the Oahe Canyon. Um, 
and I took these images back. It was a bit like also reminiscent of being in a dark room. I took the images there. I couldn't see the final outcome until I went back to my computer and processed them. And so I really felt like I was working with, working with my hands. Um, and then I started taking photos of my friends. And uh, early on, I had some glitches and some aberrations, which I really actually enjoyed. And I left them in. And I enjoyed the artifacts of this sort of disintegration. And th this is what really kept me going. And I was experimenting more. And then I, at this, at some point, I started merging, merging them together and making these sort of collages of photogrammetry. And this, for me, was also another breakthrough, breakthrough moment as I started to make these larger dioramas, recombinant dioramas, I guess I ca would call them, and just merging disparate objects together where they weren't supposed to be mixed. And uh, and for me, this is like I, I suddenly, suddenly felt like I was creating worlds. And this is actually what they do with a lot of video game creation and film creation. They create, they capture assets in the real world, bring them in, and recombine them in different ways. And so I felt like um, I was doing this act of worlding as I read this artist, Ian Chung, he has this term called worlding. And I really liked worlding as a verb. <laughs> and so that's at that moment, that's what I was thinking about. Um, and concurrently, I read this thing by Sean Cubitt and he, he writes about the mass image uh, in this essay. And he had these ideas of all these images basically coming together in my mind they're like an image singularity which i think for him he's not quite being a, a doomsayer but just sort of like wary of this massing of information and power into, into this we call the one interconnected artifice which i thought was kind of poetic so i wasn't quite at that level where i was scared of it but i was very interested in this i guess people nowadays would call it like a metaverse um but that for me was uh what kept my interest going. And then at some point I sort of like had this declaration. It's like, okay, we are almost as images in this landscape. I'm in this world with these images, living with them, just as Mr. Beans with his like <laughs> newspaper covered room. Uh, so like, I think it's time to like learn how to like really communicate and understand these images. And that's sort of become the through line of my work is this idea of media literacy and understanding the processing of images. And to do that, I started painting on them. Um, so this is uh, basically a photogrammetry scan of uh, these two homes, two houses in uh, Seattle. And I'll show you the process behind the scenes of what I'm doing. What I do is actually, I take the scan, export the scan into uh, this program called uh, Adobe Medium, where I um, Im import it and I can actually paint in 3D or sculpt it in 3D. And I'm basically just drawing upon the surface of these objects. And you can see when you import, you get these other cool artifacts, which I clean up later. Uh, uh, but th this whole process uh, for me was like this merging of myself painting and this automated process. So, that's, so I ended up calling this series uh, Centaurs, which is um, about the story of like, you know, the chess grandmaster who was beat by an AI, IBM Deep Blue, I think, and uh, came back and decided to uh, create his own chess league where you can compete alongside your own supercomputer. And to this day, the, the centaur pairing, they call a centaur peer, pairing between a human and a computer is still the most powerful or undefeated uh, chess grandmaster. So that, that was my idea is like pairing myself, my, my, me as an image into this other image by painting on it. And so I'll just run through a couple of examples of these. I, I like to do buildings. Um, uh, I like to do like natural scenes. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, and this one, I really like the way that the motorcycle turned out and how this thing sort of rests underneath. <laughs> and this is a pretty recent one too. Um, so I'm continuing to iterate on this. And as I said, the through line is image literacy. And as I play with these images in space, I, I feel like I become more literate in the sense that not only do I know the technical side of it, but you come to know it quite intimately. 
And so there's these two quotes from two media theorists. One is Douglas Rushkoff, program would be programmed, which is pretty straightforward. If uh, you don't know what's happening to you, then you sort of are under the control of some greater thing. So in this sense, if you don't know the algorithm that's controlling you, then the algorithm will just control you even more. Um, and th this second quote is from Jerry Lanier, who actually coined the term virtual reality back in, I think, the 70s, or maybe it's 90s, I, somewhere around there. <laughs> um, but even though this is related to VR, I think it still applies to like all media and image making. And he's he was he talked about he was asked in an interview what he thinks about VR um, and and it's like future and getting smaller and lighter and more accessible. Um, and he actually had this funny counterpoint. He says, I think they should be ugly and a little awkward. And his idea was behind that is that you shouldn't be able to know the difference between reality and virtual reality. That if you that a dangerous virtual reality headset is an invisible one where you can't differentiate between realities. And that's sort of my impetus for leaving in some of these glitches so you can tell what is real and what isn't like what is the machine automation and what is the hand drawn even though they both sort of blend together in a nice new way i think it's a clear distinction which i um, like to to explore um so that is that series my next steps are making these things irl in real life i have done a few things with 3d printing so making these uh, movies extruded or extruding these films. These are Edward Moybridge photographs from 1800s extruded uh, a 3D model and then I 3D print it and then I painted this metallic uh, paint. Um, and then this is a, another series I'm working on, which is um, I call it mitosis. It's like I'm, I'm scanning these cameras and 3D printing these digital twins and placing them next to each other as a sort of like structural diptych to just to compare like oh here's this digital mirror or digital shadow of these objects um so yeah that's my current thing is trying to bring these not so ephemeral ideas of computational photography into the real world where they have literal mass so that is my talk and thank you uh, very much thank you that was so great taiwan we have a couple questions um one is um so you just want to know how you're creating those art pieces. Are you, what are you doing in VR or com computationally with code? I think he means when you're painting on him. Uh, yeah. So, so I think you're asking when I bring them into VR, the, it's a special program. I, I didn't make the program. Uh, it's free. It's called Adobe Medium. You just bring in, you import your shape and then you can immediately use your paddle in your hand to paint over, over top of it. Cool. And, and and the other ones are they like are they like GAN type like that are generated by the AI model or you are programmatically how are you rendering them creating them? Oh yeah yeah so that that process of like actually generating the model that's all done with I forgot to mention the software it's called Agisoft MetaShape, which is one of many photogrammetry uh, software. There's a free open source one called Open Mesh or Meshroom one of those. Um, but what I was doing to get this weird, the weird shapes is that I was sort of not taking enough photos and leaving a lot of gaps in between. If you, if you take like a million photos around the subject, the software will have a much easier time making a perfect reconstruction of it. Um, so what I was intentionally doing is leaving out data for it to like try and interpolate and guess incorrectly and leaving in those sort of like artifacts, um, but yeah, so no, no AI GAN or anything. It's just all natural algorithm. <laughs> None of the okay. smart algorithms, yeah. And you're just using a cell phone, right? Or you, for the photos or using a DSLR? Oh, yeah. I, I use just a, my DSLR, so DSLR, which has no smart features really built into it, which I kind of like. So I have the photos on my camera. I come back to my room, and it feels like, again, like the dark room because you don't see the 3D model until you put it through and wait like an hour for it to process. So it's kind of like analog in that sense that's awesome um someone else asked what are your some of your favorite computational photo apps mm. that's a good question i don't uh there's uh i don't use that many to be honest oh i guess computational in the sense of uh 
I honestly, uh, photogrammetry is one of my favorites. Um, there is one, let me see. Uh, it's like kind of an obscure software. I'm gonna try and um, share my screen again, <laughs> sorry. Sure. Uh, but it's called Avidamux. It's, it's a way to uh, visualize how video compression works, <laughs> which has always been like a mystery and one of those like invisible things in life. Um, but this has this funny little feature where it shows the change in pixels between frames. So the way video compression works is that it looks at the similarities and pixels between frames and stores those as one value if they never change. So like pixels here will never change and they're stored as one value, but where they do change, you have to like update it. And that's what those arrows are showing the Delta. So I think that is one of my favorite ones that I came across recently. Um, just because, yeah, it's a little, yeah, kind of like optical flow. Um, it's not, that's not adding frames. Well, yeah, comp video compression doesn't add frames like optical flow usually. Um, but yeah, optical flow would be, that's, those are also cool programs. One thing I, that hit me with your talk that I wanted to just ask you to re-explain or just say one more time was the term worlding, because we like our last big art installation before COVID was, um, or our whole research lab was living systems, um, the, the art of reworlding or something, you know, and we were mm. talking about reworlding. So I just wanted to have you define worlding or how you're perceiving it one more time. Yeah, I, for me, the there's a definition that Ian Chang has, which I haven't read in a bit, um, but his, his was, he's like a video game artist. His medium is video games. And I think worlding in that context means like creating an immersive environment. I think for me, worlding was really about remixing um, and like recombining stuff. And I think uh, in that context, it like, Rerolling was about just creating new things from old things. Um, yeah, and I, I think part, maybe part of it was immersion. Maybe that's what led me to go down the VR route is like, I wanted to get cl closer into the world. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it, I think it's, again, maybe ties back to mass and presence. I haven't thought about this question. So I'm like kind of thinking out loud, but yeah, like maybe it ties back to like the idea of some thing having presence and maybe that presence is implied by, by it having a mass in your life um, yeah it's interesting because i'm thinking like a next thing if you were to take it into reworlding, which it almost is because you're kind of rebuilding a world out of disparate parts but like i found i mean that's sort of what we were talking about with the art of living systems it's like imagining a new future um by the practice of creating it sort of like speculative fiction um you know reimagining a place you inhabit to change perceptions about the places so I think in some way, maybe that is what you're doing, um, like beyond just the idea of world building, but actually using, you know, the, the, this, this artwork where you're reworlding um, what we see in front of our eyes it, as a way to kind of like uh, instigate change or, or change our perceptions. Hmm. And I think, um, yeah, I just think there's something there. I don't know. Almost like I'm riffing, but <laughs> but yeah, but I, I'm excited to see where it goes and um, to see your work in the showcase that will hopefully be on June 3rd, 23rd. Um, thank you, Taiwan. That was really great. And yeah, I'm just so glad you were able to to join us and all of you, everyone who was here for the salon, um, all the audience and the folks who were watching in live stream, and then also just the incubator artists and um who, who presented your work it was super dis like different but like I feel like everything I actually think I did a good job ordering them because I thought it was a great flow but <laughs> um thank you all for just joining us and like allowing artists to have a platform to express and then also um joining in the conversation and the conversation's not over if anyone wants to get in touch with anyone I'm sure we can manage it you can always reach out to me at Nikki at grayarea.org. Um, I can put you in touch with folks. So yeah, feel free to use the chat and say any last thoughts, but um, we were at seven o'clock and it is a Wednesday evening in this Bay Area world. And I want to thank you all for joining us for the Gray Area Artist Salon. Thanks guys and have a great evening. Thanks, Nikki.